Thank you. Thank you. Everyone can hear me all right? Yep. All right. So let's jump into it. So ICS soft pyramid, that's what the presentation is going to be about. So ICS, industrial control systems, you're going to hear me talk about this as uh, critical infrastructure. So think about power plants, chemical plants, think about manufacturing, oil rigs, power utilities. And then SOC, Security Operations Center. So a lot of us are familiar with that term, right? And then pyramids. This is not a pyramid scheme. I'm not going to be selling you anything, but kind of our traditional pyramid, our tiered system. So a big part of this presentation is really kind of defining the differences between an IT SOC, which a lot of us are familiar with, and then what is an actual ICS SOC? And then how do they coexist together, right? So we're going to be discussing that at a high level. Mm -hmm. So real quick, the agenda, we're going to hit on approximately about 10 different items. I'm not going to read this to you. Some of them will take a little bit longer than others. And so we're going to just jump right into this. Safety moment. So safety moment is really big in the culture of critical infrastructure. So we try to do safety moments at the beginning of uh, either a conference, uh, pretty much every day, at the beginning of a meeting, right? The beginning of a presentation. So safety moments is really, really important. In the IT world, we think about the CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, integrity, availability. All those pieces are important in ICS, which again, I'll kind of say critical infrastructure. Sometimes I'll say OT, operational technology. All those are important. Probably even availability is extremely important, especially if you want to make sure you're getting power to your home. But safety really does trump all of that, right? I mean, safety, no matter what, is going to trump all of that. And what we're seeing in the ICS world is there's actually, this is where actually cyber meets the physical world. And so you can actually cause harm to individuals. You can actually you know, have people without lights, without water. Um, we were discussing yesterday at dinner, and uh, you know, someone was bringing up, you know, do you remember the last time that your bank got hacked? Do you guys remember the last time that happened? Most of us can't necessarily pinpoint that time or really actually even remember it because it's just kind of a second thought. You know the money's gonna be there eventually. But do you actually, do you remember when Colonial Pipeline happened? Right, I mean, if you were on the East Coast, you definitely remember it. I mean, mass chaos, right? People are, you know, running up with different bags, trying to get gas. We all remember that colonial pipeline. Now, even though technically, you know, from what's reported, the OT side of the network, right, the part that controlled the pipeline wasn't necessarily breached, there was a ransomware on the IT side. And so it still had that same effect, that same impact of shutting it down, right? And so um, I think it was actually the billing system and some other stuff that, that got breached. And that still had an impact. So that's that's what we're talking about. You know, how do we form an operations center that's going to protect things that have a real life consequence, and try to do it in a way that hopefully you know we're not going to make mistakes, right? So the quick safety moment um, decided to kind of add a little bit of a cyber twist to this, right? You know, in safety moments we do cover safe driving, all that kind of stuff. Obviously, that probably occurred because you guys are sitting here today, so um, I'll presume that there was safe driving that, that, that happened, unless you were late, maybe you, you were going a little bit faster. But this kind of cyber twist to the, kind of the safety moment that I want to kind of talk about a little bit here comes from some massive campaigns we've been seeing in 2024. And so my team and I have really been seeing this kind of uptick where they're breaching IT networks in the critical infrastructure. And obviously the next, next logical step once you breach IT is breaching the OT side of the house, right? So just a quick safety moment on O365 account takeover. So if you or if you know customers or individuals that have Office 365, one of the things we've been seeing large campaigns on is attachments getting weaponized with a link. And so this is not like, a, <clears throat> like an executable that gets dropped right on the computer system and automatically detonates. This is more of an attachment that has a link, and that link takes you outside of the network, and it's going to take you to a site that mimics Office 365. Okay? So this is basically like credential harvesting, right? At that point, the threat actor is going to take your username, it's going to take your credentials, and then it's going to provide that to the real Microsoft Office 365 site. Now, of course, there's a, a large sense of security with a lot of organizations because we've got two-factor authentication, right? 
And all of us know that the two factor authentication can't be that great. That, right? <laughs> all right, good. I'm glad you guys are laughing. Um, so, what the threat actor does says, hey, user, let me just ask you for that two factor authentication. And now I'm going to provide Microsoft that two factor authentication, right? At that point, they now are inside your O365 account. And then the beauty for the threat actor is they can now add their own device. And when they add their own device into the Office 365 to now be an additional phone that could be used for two-factor authentication for the future, whenever they want to use it, they can add it in without Microsoft even requesting to re-authenticate or any type of additional information. So the phone is just now added into it. And so an incident response team will go in um, to, to these organizations that are critical sector, and they would go and they would check this because there was a, an assumed breach. All of a sudden they see some additional iPhones and phones that are not of the user, right? So that's a problem. So a safety moment here is if you are using O365, go to your mysignins.microsoft.com and make sure that if you are doing 2FA, which hopefully you are, that is just your phone that's on there, not other additional phones that you are unaware of. And of course, there's a QR code up here, which I recommend nobody scan, right? Because that's also not safe. So let's jump into uh, my Bible real quick. So I've kind of been in the game for about 20 plus years. Started in the late 90s. Uh, for anyone that still remembers Circuit City, I was you know fixing computers over there. And then from Circuit City, you know, move up the ladder, I ended up going to Gateway. Again, fixing computers. And then I don't know if you guys remember when there used to be like computer guys like in every single corner, right? The computer guys and changing out motherboards seemed like every city, every state had a computer guys at every corner. So that's kind of where I really started, you know, jumping into, I mean, it was, I, it was just like IT administrative type stuff. I mean, we weren't really calling it cybersecurity uh, back then, but messing with Linux, messing with the different operating systems. And then from that point, I went to a DOD contractor. Um, they were doing um, missile simulations there. I was not programming, but I was doing their IT admin stuff. And again, we weren't calling it cybersecurity. This is really early 2000s, setting up firewalls, setting up VPNs, trying to segment, trying to just make it secure, right? After a couple of years of doing that, I kind of accidentally fell into ICS. Right, industrial control systems for infrastructure. I gave you guys some examples. And the way I accidentally fell into that was with my local power utility. They were actually serving about 500,000 members over seven different counties. They were serving power to my home. And all of a sudden, it was around 2007, they popped a post up saying, we're looking for someone to do just cybersecurity. The description was like super brief. They just pretty much said, this is a new position that they're starting, hadn't existed before. And so I just said, oh, well, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's the company that provides my power. Why not go help, like, do some stuff? So I went there, and of course, I'm thinking, okay, I can spend two to three years here, and I can do really well, you know, with security and, and get them everything they need, and then they're going to be good to go. And those two to three years turned into a decade, right? Because I, I realized very quickly that it was a huge difference securing the operational technology, right, the, the the ICS, the critical infrastructure, and IT was entirely different. And it was extremely difficult to try to do both, and you kind of had these um, you know, competing outcomes. OT cared all about safety, IT cares all about, you know, you know, something's wrong, switch off the computer, you know, re, you know, do a reset, do a reinstallation of the operating system, so the mindset was completely different. So I spent a decade there, we had about 50 different substations, again, like I said, about 500,000 members, our employees was only about 500 individuals. And so after a decade, I had an opportunity to go to Deutsche Bank. I went to Deutsche Bank, started running the operations center over there and doing incident response. The employees went from 500 to 80,000. And so now we were protecting 80,000 employees. Sometimes from themselves, but nonetheless, 80,000 employees, right? Okay, and we'll just be reported, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> and then uh, decided to go to 1898, which is part of Burns McDonald, right? It's kind of that consulting arm, that cybersecurity arm. And the reason why I went there, they decided to start an ICS soft, ICS specific focus soft, which makes sense for an engineering company that's already 
building the substations and building all this stuff, right? Doing things on oil rigs and so forth. So I joined that, been there for about two years, and that's pretty much kind of 20 plus years summed up um, in, in like two minutes. So let's kind of jump into the presentation, kind of the meat and potatoes of it. High level network diagram real quick. So before anyone freaks out, especially super technical people, I put this slide on here only because I knew if I got too detailed, everyone would start just looking at all the pieces and then they'd stop listening to them. So I only put this up here to show that there is, by stating the obvious, there is a distinct separation between IT network and OT network. There is a huge difference. There is a different way in how you have to manage it from a cyber and security operations center. And yes, there's pieces in here that are not showing, but in the 90s and early 2000s, you had your IT network, right? And everyone was focused on the perimeter, right? You put up your firewall, put up the VPN. Uh, VPN. It's kind of like that m and model, right? Kind of hard on the outside, super soft on the inside, right? And you assumed, okay, we're good, we're protected. Then they started to realize the industry, holy crap, we gotta actually put more stuff on the inside. Assume compromise, you know, uh, get quick to detect, get quick to respond. And then on IT network, that's where you start seeing EDRs, endpoint detection and response, CrowdStrike, DLP, data loss prevention. You know, uh, antiviruses start getting a little bit better. IDSs, intrusion detection systems. IPSs, intrusion prevention systems. Start seeing all these things being put on the inside, your DMZs, right? All that stuff. And sure, the printer was part of it, but now you got a lot more on the inside that you're using to prevent, to detect, to respond, right? And guess what the OT around that time was thinking? Well, all this has happened on IT. The OT network and the OT individuals started thinking, hey, we just, you know what we need to do? We just need to have a strong perimeter. So have a strong perimeter, let's just set up a firewall. We'll be good. But it's almost like, you know, we're, we're you know, we're trending like 10, 15 years behind, right, on the OT. But it does make sense because on the OT side of the house, critical infrastructure, you put up devices that are supposed to last 15, 20, 25 years. And now we're at a point where when these things start dying off, these different devices, these PLCs, programmable logical controllers, your HMIs, human machine interfaces, all these things, they're now getting replaced with things that are more interconnected, right? They got IP addresses, which means they got a way you can get to them. And then the OT and the industry started thinking, hey, you know what? Maybe just perimeter protection is not enough anymore. Right? It's almost kind of like deja vu that's happening. And so now the IT network is basically like the internet to the OT network. And this is where you have to start trying to protect the OT network. But I'm going to talk about some of the difficulties and some of the problems that are happening. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the traditional SOC skill set, the Security Operations Center. I made this super brief, right, because I'm not a, a believer in just having an entire paragraph on a slide to read to you. So this is not all inclusive, so don't anybody get offended. But your traditional skill set is going to be obviously a, a strong networking background, right, TCP IP. You're going to want to have potentially some good offensive security skills, right? Some of the tools, Metasploit, uh, NMAP, Messes, Bloodhound, Mimikatz, right? Your Mimikatz is going to go to the LSAS process, is going to take your password right outside of the memory, and you're going to do all this cool, fun stuff. Then defensive security, traditional skill sets on the IT side, right? I named a bunch of them, IDRs, IPSs, IDSs, uh, and so forth. This is kind of your defensive security, the skill sets that your security operations center needs to have. And then there's different job functions. Again, not all inclusive, but you're gonna have people who are specialized in incident response, people who are specialized in engineering, right? How you do the proper segmentation, uh, how you do the proper VLANing, how you set up you know, the, the appropriate network that you need. Threat intel, threat intelligence, getting those feeds, right? Um, looking at virus total, comparing hashes, you know, what's infected, what's not, automation, and then your, your standard IT analyst, right? That IT analyst now, you have this tiered system. So that's where we start talking about that pyramid, right? That pyramid where the, the biggest part of the bottom of the pyramid is your tier ones. So you got tier ones, 
And then you have escalation points based on the different playbooks that you have going into tier two, tier three, and then you have your speeds. And this is traditionally how your IT SOC is gonna work. And it does make sense in many ways. Uh, definitely makes sense to the, to the executives that are having to, um, you know, uh, you know, keep cost in mind, right? You gotta keep cost in mind. So it makes sense to just have, you know, maybe tier ones, one to three years out of school. Um, they're building their skill set. And when you need someone with higher expect, uh, expertise, you start moving up the ladder, right? And you have less individuals that have the, the 10 years experience, the 15 years experience, right? So that's your traditional uh, SOC pyramid if we look at this piece, okay? Basically, that's what I'm explaining. Your tier one, two, three, and then your SME, your expert, that's sitting at the top. Now, I put here customer. Customer can be different things. If you're working, let's say, for um, a bank or you're working for some other critical infrastructure, power utility, whatever it might be, the customer is that organization that you're protecting. I mean, even though you're still one of the employees, you're treating the other part of the business as the customer. Sometimes if you're doing a managed security service, right, then it becomes more obvious who your customers are. It's all the customers who you're onboarding and all the different clients that, that you're protecting and you're feeding all those things into like a SIM, for example. But the traditional model for IT soft, for informational technology, is you typically, again, not all inclusive, but you're typically gonna have, let's say, some type of engineer who can do uh, threat detection writing, who can do tuning, for example, on your SIM, and is gonna try to feed these appropriate alerts to the tier one. So they're gonna give your informational, your low, your medium, your high, all these things are being fed into your tier one analysts. Now there is a little bit of a, of a delay that happens here, and that delay is how fast can that engineer, that threat detection engineer, the guy who's, who's working maybe on spawn or on park site, how fast can they do the tuning? Because sometimes that low gets adjusted to a high. Sometimes that high gets adjusted to a medium. Sometimes 10 lows happening within a certain period of time can be considered some type of medium or high alert. So there's all these different types of use cases and things that have to happen, and your turnaround time typically I mean, you guys know how it is with passion, right? When we're talking sometimes weeks and you gotta test it, though so sometimes it's a weeks and it's months to feed that straight to the tier one. You also have that situation when it comes to um, incident response. At what point are you activating incident response? So many times you're putting it in the hands of a tier one analyst to ensure based on their playbooks that they know when to engage in incident response. And then we have threat intelligence. Same thing. I mean, we do try to automate, you know, the hell out of it, you know, threat intel feeds, connecting API, doing all those pieces, but you still have someone either threat intel or in some type of role making sure that API works or making sure that the data is getting enriched so that analysts can look at, right? Providing context to, is this IP bad? Is this hash value bad, right? Is this thing blacklisted? All those pieces become important. But again, there's a certain amount of delay. And that's not necessarily like, like a gigantic problem, I would say. I would say it's an accepted risk. It's kind of a way of, uh, uh, of doing business. And it works pretty well. So I'm not trying to change the IT SOC period in the way that we know it, right? But the problem that we're having, and let me touch on a little bit on the ICS skill set. And again, this is not necessarily all inclusive. On the ICS skill set, yes, you still have all the networking, and, it, and traditionally, most of the time, you have everything that's going to be IT. And now you got to compound that with different things like Modbus, right? Different protocols, DMP3, right? Your Modbus is going to be send, sending things in clear uh, text, for example. Your DMP3 is going to be uh, encrypted. You have uh, HMIs, human machine interfaces, you have to deal with. You have things like a SCADA system where um, a SCADA system actually looks like sometimes like you're being attacked. And the reason why, because I remember when I was working at the power utility, you had 50 substations that were receiving this probing information back and forth from one that, this one centralized system, right? And it was actually more about, what no, SCADA works that way, right? SCADA sending the commands from a centralized place, 
and they're sending commands out to all these different substations, they have to talk back home, right? So it's almost like a nice little botnet. That's how a lot of the detection tools see it. But it's not, it's not a botnet, right? So there's a different skill set. And then offensive security in the ICS talk. So I did a straight copy and paste on this from the IT slide, because I want to have a little fun with this. And so I'm going to go a little bit slow on this piece because there's some members of the team that I'm part of that are specifically part of the OT, ICS, pen testing, and it's a response team. And they're probably freaking out right about now, and they want to come up here and tackle me because they know that there's no way in hell you can do Metasploit, Nmap, Nessus, Bloodhound, Mimikatz, that type of offensive security on an ICS network. But I decided to leave it up there to, to screw with them because I, I knew they would be like freaking out. And they're, they're somewhere over here, so if you see them freaking out, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the OT pen testers and insert response team. But there's a big reason why you can't do this stuff. The PLCs, the SCADA, the HMIs, human machine interfaces, these things start to fall over, literally. I mean, Metasploit, if you're going to try to run some type of exploitation on some device, you actually might cause some physical consequence, right? You're going to most likely bring something down. So pen testing is extremely hard in OT. It is very manual. Sometimes you actually are better off creating like a mock-up environment or something that is as close to like a miniaturized basically version that's representing what that organization is running, and then you can run, you know, all you want on that particular system, right? Because there's not going to be a physical impact to whatever it is you're protecting. I mean, imagine being on an oil rig and then trying to run this kind of stuff. I mean, if none of you guys have ever been on an oil rig, first of all, just real quick, kind of a side tangent here. On the oil rig, you have to go through what's called Bozier safety training, right? That training is they'll put you in this mock-up kind of pretend helicopter in a huge tank, right? You know, they're gonna put your seatbelt on really tight, and then they're gonna flip you over underwater, and you gotta pause for a moment, and then you gotta make sure you're swimming out, and that's part of the training. You go on the oil rig and fly on the helicopter, and normally when you're gonna go do maybe one thing, you're gonna end up still spending the night there two days because you gotta wait for the next helicopter to come in if you're right. And so you don't want to be, I mean, you're, there's nowhere to run at that point. If you're doing offensive security, especially like all over or something like that. So you have to be really, really sensitive to that fact. And then defensive security. Defensive security also becomes really difficult as well because um, you can't necessarily just put agents on anything, even if you wanted to. So some stuff uh, the industry is getting better about creating agents that are OT specific, right? But there's some things like a PLC, some of the HMIs, there's some pieces of hardware that just an agent's not gonna go on, right? You're not, it's just not going to happen. Then you're also contending with regulations. Some of the regulations, you can start thinking about NERC SIT, whether you're low, medium, high. You don't know about NERC SIT? God bless you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot to it. So you also don't want to mess up the uh, you don't, want to, you don't want to mess up their nurse, you know, audit and, and, and the pieces that they're, they're saying that they're uh, attesting to, right? So that becomes really important. So sometimes your defensive mechanism is, hey, we're going to add a sensor into the OT network, and now we're going to span off a switch, and basically we're going to collect copies of traffic off the switch, and then we're going to monitor this in a passive mode, right? And a lot of the ICS community, a lot of the critical infrastructure and people that are responsible for it, like the plant managers and all this, will get fairly comfortable with this because it's, hey, we're not doing anything active. This is all going to be passive, right? And we're just going to do a spam port. And because that spam port, for the most part, is not routable, it does help with a lot of the, the compliance and regulations that you have to um, abide by, depending on what... You know, sometimes it's TSA, there's different regulations that are out there, depending on what you're trying to protect. But you are at a little bit of a disadvantage, and so you have to have that right experience to know that you're only going to get potentially, right, if you're just seeing copies, first of all, you've got to make sure you're spanning in the right spot. 
right? And now we're assuming like there's proper segmentation that's being done, architecture, that's a whole other presentation in and of itself. If there's certain architecture or segmentations, the right place to put a sensor to get the right amount of traffic. And then you have to have an individual that can look at that and say, I have three pieces of a puzzle that is like 10 pieces that I can tell you with a high certainty that that is most likely an elephant, right? And you want to, with some high probability, be right about it. But that's going to take a lot of experience and know-how on the engineering, how do the different devices work. Then there's job functions, incident response, CI is for critical infrastructure, by the way, engineering, Intel automation, and analysts, right? A lot of the same roles, but not nearly the same skill set, right? How do you forensically grab an image off a laptop traditionally in IT? A lot of us know we can, we can plug in devices, we can clone hard drives, we can do things like that. In the OT, ICS world, that becomes a lot more difficult. Maybe it's more about packet capture, or you have to have the, uh, a different type of hardware and device to accomplish that. Engineering is also different. I touched on that a little bit. Your intel, right, your threat actors that you're contending with is going to be different that are going after OT, right? They might be going after safety, um, you know, safety systems. They're going to be a lot more covert many times. And your automation, your automation is great, but it's also limited. Automation is great to correlate data that you have, but not always necessarily to, again, do something automatically on a physical device, right? And then you have your analysts. So we have the same tiered system with analysts. Tier one, two, three, and four. And what we start realizing here is, this is kind of what our ICS pyramid, right? That's the OT network, you didn't catch that. That's your operational technology, your ICS network. And what your pyramid actually really looks like is flipped upside down, okay? And I would love to say that, you know, the team that I'm part of, that we, we had this grand idea and this is how we started, but this was not the case. This, this really organically kind of happened. And this organically happened because of the demand of the customers and the individuals and the stakeholders that are responsible for things in the industrial control systems, like power plants, water utilities, pipelines, all that stuff. They are not willing, because the risk is too high, they're not willing to put cyber security operations centers as in the hands of someone that is a tier one, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality of it, right? So they want the front lines of the operations center to be people who have experience in those different areas, that know what OT is, that have worked in OT, and so that's kind of your, your front and center. And so now, instead of your IT uh, model where the SME or the tier threes are activated from the bottom up. Instead, your SMEs are at the top and they're using the threes, twos, and ones as a support mechanism, right? It's a support mechanism to help get either a particular uh, project accomplished or a particular task accomplished to support incident response, to support some of the triage, but not to spearhead it, not to lead it, right? And so the famous kind of convergence, kind of that buzzword, did my best to stay away from it, but I'm going to use it anyways. So we have convergence. So this, so this is what it ends up looking like. You got your IT SOC, and then you got your ICS SOC, right? Completely uh, flipped parents here. So how do, we, how do we deal with this? Okay, One way to deal with it, and it's, I'm openly going to admit, a lot of times this is not necessarily obtainable or sometimes unrealistic from a financial standpoint is you just get two entirely uh, teams, two entirely like dedicated teams for IT, two completely different experts and everything for, uh, for uh, ICS, right? With the appropriate skill set. And so you're saying, oh great, you basically just told me just hire a bunch of SMEs and then we call it good. But I understand that's not the reality of the situation, right? Um, this is cost prohibitive. It's not the reality of many people in the critical infrastructure space, right? And so this is an option for some, but not an option for many in the critical infrastructure space, right? Depending on how, you know, we're talking about small, medium, large uh, size uh, critical infrastructure utilities, again, chemical plants, so forth. 
So what really starts to happen? This is now starting to stem more on the reality of how we start tackling kind of this, let's say, combined security operations at home. So the reality is uh, many times IT, right, the, the execs up, up top are going to say, we already have a security operations center. That IT SOC is going to just continue security operations center for ICS, right? I mean, sounds, sounds simple enough. But the way you really have to start thinking about it and accomplishing this is you will have to have individuals wearing many different hats. Now, that's not foreign to the majority of us in cyber at all. We probably say it like all the time, you know. Um, you know, frequently people on my team, even myself, are asked, what do you do? And it's like, I don't know, it depends on the week, right? It depends on the week, depends on the month, and, the, and it's the same for them, right? People on the team, they're like, well, this week I'm instant response, this week I'm doing engineering, this week I'm, uh, you know, threat hunting, this week I'm intel, right? Depending on the different skill sets. But what I'm proposing, and what actually is the way we formed our ICS SOC, and we proved to be successful, is we start really being intentional about how the different hats are worn, right? And again, this is a high level, if you think about an individual here, they can have a very high skill set on a tier four, they can be a SME in that ICS upside down pyramid, right? And yet they can just be a tier two security analyst at the IT level. Right? You have another example here of another kind of if you look at that middle line of someone that has a skill set, right? I mean, we're looking at peaks and valleys, right? And we can really, when you start getting in detail, you start spelling out what those peaks and valleys actually mean. What are they really a SME in? They're SME in knowing what PLCs are, they're SME in this type of sensor, they're SME in this kind of thing within the um, within the ICS world, right? So all these roles, right, this is high level, all these roles do get defined based on what type of critical infrastructure sector you're part of. What a tier one, tier two, three, and four in SMEs mean to you will be different for every for every single organization. So that, those have to get defined. But regardless of the fact, this is what your team starts looking at, looking like. You have Someone that's, again, if you look at that middle line, you have someone that's uh, a tier three, but yet from an IT standpoint, they're literally equivalent to a tier one. And that's fine. And then you have someone on the bottom line that is a tier two in the ICS world, but they're an expert when it comes to IT protection. So it's really kind of this, and that's why we call it convergence, but there's a, an intentional, intentional way to do this type of convergence, right? That's where you kind of look at these pyramids unite, right? And I'm not going to sit here and teach a math class, right? But this is kind of two pyramids coming together in this way. It's called an octahedron, right? Well, like octa because it's eight sides and all that jazz. Again, I promise no math classes. You know, we're not doing math class here. So let's take a look at this in a different way. What we did at, I, at the ICS stock to make sure we're supporting critical infrastructure is we take one individual, right, an individual one by one, and you start identifying what that skill set is. Now, for the sake of just not making this super long um, and, and super detailed, again, you have to define what incident response means in IT, what incident response means uh, in the ICS world, but you have to have those levers and determine where they fall on on that particular pyramid. And so here we look at this 3D model, but if you look here on the side, this is now kind of put in, in 2D, right? You can actually see how these pyramids for this individual pan out. And you can quickly start to look at, if you look at this uh, blue pyramid here, um, instant response, they're kind of right in the middle. If you look at the next, right, this, this orange upside down pyramid on instant response, they're a SME. And they're also seeing on Intel, both ICS and IT, right? And so you start having to map this out for every single individual, and then you have to start putting this on top of each other, and you start finding out where that gap of that skill set is. And depending on what situation you're in, whether you're in a, in a position to either hire, right? You're hiring based entirely on skill set, not necessarily saying, hey, I need a tier one or I need a tier two. You're hiring on where those gaps are, okay? Now, if you're not necessarily in the position to just hire certain individuals and you're working with individuals that are there, you can actually have people that are part of ICS, right? They've been, they've been in OT forever, 
And you can bridge the gap, some of that skill set. You can more easily bridge the gap to IT. Or vice versa, you can bridge the gap in IT to that OT skill set. So the simplest example here is if you looked at two first pyramids here, the, the, uh, the upright one in incident response, and the upside down orange one, right, representing ICS, you can see, it is a much smaller bridge to unite someone that's an expert in IR and ICS to become more of an expert in incident response on the IT, right? And so it's more about the chemistry of the team and the balance of the team. And not just saying, hey, I just wear multiple hats. You're really starting to systematically kind of approach this in a more intentional way. And then that's where you really start combining um, your security operation center to make sure that it's appropriately supporting IT and ICS. And then you can actually start having some of your automation actually not just doing all the things we know that it does already, but your automation can actually start putting it in the hands of the right individual that has the appropriate skill set for the, the type of alert that it is based on the network or the area that it happens. You put it in the hands of the right individual based on if they're you know, currently logged in, for example. If they're logged into the SIM, they're on shift, you're gonna get it to the most appropriate in, you know, person. And that is number one when it comes to an organization that's doing ICS because too much is on the line. Right? Like I said, safety is paramount. So too much is on the line and, they, and you, have to put, um, you have to put that in the hands of, of the right individuals, right? And so again, put the SMEs there, you, you build the different skill sets and you're, you're not gonna have that lag time, right? That lag time of tuning, or identifying 10 lows that should really be a high, uh, and so forth. So some of you might be thinking this, and we've heard the term, uh, many of us. So you're basically saying you become a jack of all trades and a master of none. But there's another piece of this whole thing that never gets said, and this is where the challenge, and all of us in cyber love challenges, and so this is really where the phrase should continue, right? but oftentimes better than a master of one. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, everyone. Yes? What does the management level look like for uh, a merger between IP and OD? Do you, do you have the uh, both sides of the to use one set of individuals? Or? So ideally, you try, to con you try to condense that management to be one that's responsible just for the entire ops or cybersecurity for both ICS and IT. Ideal world, right? Yeah. But many times, it's actually two individuals that just have to come to an agreement and work together. But it's a little bit easier, right? Because when I, when I show both the pyramids, having two entire teams put into one, that's very difficult. But when it comes to like a leadership role where you're talking about management, what we're seeing the trend is it, it's coming down to many times one individual, right? Because it's very doable that they can oversee this, that overarching operation. Like your, 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 uh, your love slide that had a little uh, lines showing, you know, the, the person who is a, say, a, a pure one. Yeah, yeah, that one. That, that, that one. That is like our environment. Perfectly. Oh, is this really? Currently, right now. But our problem is we don't have a circle manager. So we're small that small is team. We're kind of, small we're team. Kind of at that spot right now where we're trying to make it all in one, and we're, we're trying to decide if we want one manager. Yeah, I, that was that was weird to look at. Yeah, ideally I would go with one is ideal, right? One is ideal, and they just the key for that one person is just knowing where the strengths are and how to get it routed right appropriately, and how do you get your your sin? That's ideally one sin because we have environments where hey, I got maybe a sin in OT and maybe a sin in IT. You ideally want this one sin. It's more about attacking it and getting the right people to look at it. Awesome. Good question. Thank you. Yes, question back there. <clears throat> Do you ever run into scenarios where, say, corporate has one set of policies and maybe the OT network is unionized and has a different set of policies and how you navigate that? All the time. All the time. Yeah, that is. Yeah, all the time. So. You have competing interests is exactly like what you're alluding to with these different policies, right? Um, the competing interests. But 
So a couple of things to answer that. So first, when I was at the utility, that we found the most success was integrating ourselves into the safety culture and making cyber, it, hey, this is a safety problem. It's not just some boring uh, meeting you gotta go to about phishing emails. So we made it you know, part of the safety problem. But to really kind of answer your question, kind of that, okay, so as much as regulation sometimes is a pain, it is sometimes very much your friend. Because a lot of times that trumps everything. Hey, this regulation, like we don't have a choice. This is what we're mandated to do. This is what we have to do from the government. And this is safety, right? And so a lot of times you can drive policies more from the OT and you can get that IT side uh, to really kind of start abiding more by that, right? Because of the bread and butter, of the, you know, for example, on an electric utility, without the OT network and the substations, there is no power utility, right? I mean, IT is important, right? You got to build people, get paid, right? But it's it's really influencing the OT and working that policies into the the IT. You got to yeah. got to push for that change because if not, you're consistently going to be competing, right? Competing interests. And that's that's where um, some of the executive levels, from a cost perspective, perspective really want to keep that um, IT soft pyramid. Because if you notice, it's Financially, it's a lot cheaper to keep a lot of tier ones and a smaller amount of tier twos, threes, and, and SMEs. And it's sometimes either more costly or it's just entirely more complicated. You don't have to drop a ton of money to, to get kind of experts and get this combined, but you have to invest a lot in the training. You have to be very intentional about how your chemistry works on the teams. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions from anyone? Oh, yes, right. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when dealing with OT spaces, you're, you have people who are worried about, you know, they, they can buy an auditor or doing this offensive security test. Uh, how do you recommend socializing with those folks to make sure that they're at ease and that the test isn't going to cause issues? So your question is more about how do you make sure, like, it's not, you're not going to cause problems with an auditor when it comes to, like, doing offensive security in the OT space? <coughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and more, you know, the folks who have to deal with your audience, you know, how do you, you know, communicate with them to let them know, like, hey, we're going to be careful with this test, you need to bring in certain tools that may not be, you know, ideal in this environment, but it's still something you want to get done. Yeah, the biggest key is, and we do this for ourselves, is we audit, we get, like, auditors before the, like, the real, quote-unquote, real auditors come in, right? And then we use a lot of their own language, everything's spelled out in their language, of so you must do X, and we and we provide that same verbiage to say, well, this tool meets, like, you just draw that line. This tool, like an end map, potentially, and then map, depending on how you do it, definitely very manual, just doing this one engineering workstation is accomplishing this exact thing. So whatever that verbiage is from the auditors, or if you could use other supporting mechanisms like your cyber insurance, you can say, hey, my cyber insurance has this list of 50 things, this is how I'm meeting it, but you're also coming in and auditing me, your audit says you must right, abide by this, and you just have to draw direct lines to their own verbiage. So that's the only way you're gonna explain it. Because if you try to explain the details of offensive security, then you, We've lost them because many of the auditors are not going to be ex experts in pen testing, let alone when it comes to an ICS environment. So you have to do like this drastic amount of translation, basically. Yeah, good question. Yes, over here. Yeah, um, the fragility of OT networks and the skill sets needed for them are pretty different from the IT side of the house. I'm finding that you communicate those particular issues to, to leaders more traditionally in the IT space. So it does take a lot of um, education, right? Um, you really have to... So there's no easy answer to what you're, what you're asking, right? So you're, you're basically, your question is how do you communicate what has to be done in OT, right? And then you communicate how something can effectively be done. How do you communicate that to the IT space, right? Basically. And so, and I'm repeating the question for, for the recording as well so they, they can hear it. Um, you have to get into the details. There's really no way around it. So you individually have to say, here's how this endpoint detection, like EDR, let's say CrowdStrike, for example. Here's how CrowdStrike can work in OT, right? As well as work in IT. But, but you have to use a lot of use cases. You have to show where it's worked, 
You have to show that you've done it in a lab. And so uh, beyond the discussions, you have to go and uh, do the extra effort to actually prove it, right? You have to prove one by one. The biggest win for us in cybersecurity was explaining the sensor and how the sensor was passive, what passive actually meant, what spamming meant, and then what spamming means that you're only getting a copy, and you would have to explain it in a way that, hey, if this sensor completely gets compromised, that does not mean it's an automatic compromise of the operational technology, because it's a spamming, right? It's a copy of the packet, it's not routable. So you're not gonna route it. So you have to break it down that way, and you have to make it super visual. You have to make it very visual, and then you also have to use verbiage that's outside of your organization. So half the time when we're making a new space or, or trying to get something across, I don't use my words, I don't use the words of the team. I use words that are, if it's a regulation or if it's anything that's out there that some other study has been done, I use the words of other organizations that say, this is best practice, this is what's accepted, right? Because I'm not, it's looked at that, oh, maybe you just, you just have the agenda to get this done, right? Or not do it. Right, because it can be vice versa, like this is very unsafe to do. And so they might look at it as it's you saying that it's unsafe. But instead, you take yourself out of the picture and get, you know, 100 people that got together, 100 really smart people that got together and said, this is best practice. That's the words you want to use to bring that into the conversation. Yes? Um, do you have much experience or uh, insight for whenever you're going to bring like racking? cloud service providers and equipment in the OT space because AI you know, workloads, stuff like that, or they're going to get into our emerge uh, all stuff together. And, uh, yeah. yeah, a lot of pain. Yeah, maybe not the critical infrastructure, but maybe like where there's manufacturers that want to really produce goods. Um, it's not so critical. But it's only a matter of time, I think. It's just, so cloud's getting really hard to get away from. Proof of that is like NERCSIT in January is now starting to address cloud. They're finally coming around to the realization that in critical infrastructure, even in electric utilities and power utilities, cloud like is a reality. And so, um, yeah, introducing it's gonna be really tough. I mean, you really have to lock down, like if you think about the Purdue model, right? Those five layers of the Purdue model, you're really kind of at that 3.5, that DMC of the operational technology. And so you really have to prove um, what you're doing at that 3.5 of that DMZ level is very safe. But there are critical infrastructure that are out there that are utilizing the cloud. I don't, I don't think we can get away from it. And so um, the hard part is there has to be people that publicly go first, like in a documented way, because the only way other organizations, your organization, for example, the only way they're most likely going to be comfortable is by saying this huge place did it, this medium-sized company did it, this is how they did it, and, but someone's got to go first, right? What now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, cloud is just another way. I mean, we have plumbing that comes out of OT, right? From a networking perspective anyways. So you just don't call it cloud, just say we're connecting to an infrastructure, right? That's what it is, right? You're just connecting out, right? Antiviruses, all these other things, they have to, they have to get out. So air gapped, in case you guys don't know this, like air gapped for the most part is not a reality, right? That just does not exist, really, in my opinion. Maybe at one point it did, but not maybe not on purpose. It was just because there was massive amount of manual things that were happening, right? Good question. Any thoughts on how we can learn more about the systems? For example, I'll give you an example. I didn't know about this until I read Andrew Greenberg's book, Stay at Work, okay? And I learned about Not Petya. That was a great book for anyone who's lost. But then I know you have your Sands Masters, right? They have a class, it's eight grand. You know, what can some people yeah. who maybe, because like, I learned about the reality of the seriousness of this when I thought about the chaos that would happen to a city if the lights had turned off. How do you drive in a city with no stoplights? How many cops do we have that can, you know, turn it all or something? So, yeah. any thoughts yeah. on resources, research, books you've read? Um, so there happens to be, and I don't want to put Pascal necessarily on the spot, so he's actually right in front of you. Pascal, just quickly raise your hand. Yep. So Pascal's on our team. He actually wrote a book on ICS, specifically in, in security and ICS. Great book. That is a great start. 
His book does not cost $8,000, so that's good. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, I wish. I wish it cost that much. Yeah. So that's definitely a good start. Idaho National Labs also has a lot of um, free resources on that. Um, not like this is a plug, but like Try Hackney, right? They don't pay me on sponsors. But Try Hackney is actually starting to add ICS, like hands on keyboard um, type stuff. So Try Hackney is a pretty good site. I think Hack the Box is starting to do a couple things with ICS. Um, Pascal's book, like I said, with ICS stuff. So, yes, there's, there's starting to become more free resources out there. But I would say one of the top things is, and I love this in general about all cybersecurity, and this is no different on the OT space, is reach out like on connections, like on LinkedIn or whatever it might be, because they are, you know, you have a network of individuals that are more than willing to point you specifically in the right direction depending on what your interests are, if it's like electric utility space or just what is a PLC, like how does that actually work? How does the Purdue model, like all those pieces, you can get pointed in the right direction um, just with people here that are in that critical infrastructure space. I'm gonna point those three people out, actually they're sitting right over there, right right in front of you. So yeah, they're within they're within talking distance. So, they, so this is a team that does uh, OT pen testing, they do OT incident response. Um, we're all on a team together, so sorry guys, I volunteered. Thank you. <laughs> Great question though, that's a huge thing. So I see a lot more training coming, so. Excellent question. Any other questions? A lot of good questions. Yes. Uh, in the environment, like, I mean, uh, I'm just generalizing a bunch of here. A lot of it, like IT seems to be outsourced. With OT, is it more in house? Yeah, so your question is more like, so a lot of IT could be outsourced, and then is OT more in source? Um, yeah. It depends. So you're actually seeing some of the OT uh, cybersecurity being outsourced that skill set as well. If you can find the skill set, because it does become very difficult to get someone in cyber. Like, if, for example, if they're already outsourcing the IT component of it. It's it's probably a high hurdle to then all of a sudden get someone that has the proficiency and, and necessary knowledge in OT. Right? It's, it's actually a, a bigger hurdle than I thought. And so we are starting to see that kind of ICS soft and those things getting out so it's also so yes yeah. because for some people it's going to be difficult to say hey I just need four or five employees and full time employees and benefits and 401k and all in the yards right as opposed to just what you, what you actually see a lot of is um, someone that is hyper focused on the monitoring piece right the cyber security monitoring piece and then they partner with people that are boots on the ground that are employees, and they actually do what they're doing, like, oh, I gotta reset the password, or I'm gonna do active directory stuff. And so you're seeing that kind of team. Yes? Around baseline, you have an ICS or testing team here. When they respond, what are some things? I said, they could, but I assume you want that for sure. Oh, absolutely. So what are some additional things that you might want as a, as a response? Your team so response like from a hardware standpoint or just like in just like what are they going to do once their boots yeah, on the ground? Response, response mm -hmm. to the, the ICS incident where ransomware on a CNC machine. Yeah, so an ICS, your biggest thing is going to be visibility. And a lot of times the incident responders are going to walk into something where there's not visibility set up in place. And so unfortunately, if they're not doing an incident response plan that's specific to OT and IT, then you're in a situation where this incident response plan works right on IT, but your OT got And so unfortunately, the beginning stage is more of a discovery stage of, let me look at your network diagrams, let me look at the architecture. So if the planning wasn't done, you're going to have stakeholders and executives going crazy because you're going to spend one entire day just figuring out what's what and what's where. Right? How, what are the choke points? What are the segments? What are things that are, that are really essential? And then from that point, what you really end up doing is you've got to put some type of collector and you got to start getting tons of packets. Get tons of packets in a computer system, you put it in something like, let's say, Malcolm, and Malcolm's going to like now think of it just as a, a sim on steroids. It's going to start running all these threat rules on it and it's going to start trying to find. Um, patient zero, right, whatever, where the infection actually started, or start doing, you start 
querying through things in pipelines of movement analysis. And so but at that point, you <coughs> stop the bleeding, right? You're trying to stop the bleeding. And so you start doing things on your firewall, so you cut off uh, a lot of the communication where possible. You cut that off from IT and you know, also the internet. Because, like I said, OT might not be directly connected to the internet, but it goes through GMZ, IT, then the internet. So inadvertently, it can be. And if the threat actors in there and there's ransomware, they've probably created a ton of development. So you're trying to stop the bleeding, you're going to do something on the firewall to cut off connections as long as it doesn't, again, you have to have the expertise to know that when I cut firewall connection, this doesn't make all my operators just completely blocked, right? But so typically you can do something on the firewall so you're not specific enough to say, I only trust this IP going around that. That's where you start stopping the bleeding and then you actually, if segmentation's not being done, well guess what? You now start doing segmentation so you can segment where that right somewhere is actually spreading. That's initially like your first 24 to 40 hours. Sometimes that's the hours. That's a great question. Yeah. And if you want like the detailed equipment that you need, <clears throat> again, I'm going to volunteer Brett Steele over there. Brett, raise your hand real quick. Brett, raise your hand. Hi, so I'm volunteering you, so if they want to know specific about hardware instant response, I told them to come talk to you. I encourage a lot of my customers to remain, keep those manual processes in place in case. You're 100% you're right. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. but, but that's getting away from us some, some as well. Well, that's why also can get something away from the pen and paper. So yeah, so the manual process, some of the gear that's being sold, it's like, Sometimes you're not manual operators. When I was at the utility, we were that was the backup thing. We had manual. Ukraine had a manual attack, right? They won manual. 